Amen. First Peter chapter 4. We're going back to finish um, our series in the book of First Peter. Um, we just got a couple of messages left. Um, and the theme of First Peter is that Jesus is our living hope. And I felt that as we were coming through the end of this pandemic year, that we needed to know that there is hope, um, that, um, that we don't just simply endure for no reason at all, but that there is hope in Christ. And we're going to be reading um, starting in verse 12 and going through the end of chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. In our text this morning, if you remember, it's kind of like Peter is going back and uh, and picking up the same focus or theme that he had in the beginning of chapter 4, the end of chapter 3, which was a theme of suffering. And this time, he's not talking about suffering for doing good, but suffering for bearing the name of Christ, for being a Christian, for, for loving Jesus and following him. And, and, he, and this kind of seems strange to us because we live in a culture that has been greatly influenced by Christian values. But in the first century, we must remember that that culture was not influenced by Christian values. It was a pagan culture. Um, they worshipped idols. Um, that, that what we would consider to be poor behavior, they considered to be normal behavior. Um, the general culture of that first century did not agree with um, the values, the Christian values of uh, of the Old Testament are the Christian values that Jesus taught. Um, in fact, they oppose them in, in practically every way. So what do you do with people who don't believe like you believe? What do you do with people who <clears throat> um, are not normal according to the cultural uh, you know, standard that the, the culture around you is living? Well, The people of the first century who looked at Christians, which were a small minority, the church was still growing, they looked at them as being different. In fact, they called them idolaters because they weren't worshiping the right gods. And they chose to reject them, to ridicule them, and eventually they made laws against them. And Peter says to the church, he says, why are you surprised that this culture is acting the way it does toward you. Just don't be surprised. They don't hold your values. Remember, we have an unseen enemy. And the unseen enemy is not just simply the people of the culture, but it's the, it's the influence behind people who don't follow Christ, who can, uh, uh, you know, bring a greater influence against the church. And the people in the first century were experiencing this. And then they were going through uh, suffering. There were trials. They they were being excluded out of trade unions. They they were being ridiculed. They were being ostracized. 
And, and they were beginning to wonder, did we make the right decision in following Christ? And Peter writes to them and he says, you bear the name of Jesus. Why do you consider it surprising that non-Christians are treating you this way? Because you are entirely opposite of what they think is right. Now, this painful trial in some translations, and actually in the Greek, it's a fiery trial. Yeah, no one likes fiery trial. How many people say, I, I, I think I want to pick up a fiery trial this week. I, it's, that's not something we want to do. We don't like that. But you know, the Bible does talk about pain and suffering as a part of life. It's, it's always a part of life. You, you can't go through life without experiencing any kind of pain or suffering. Uh, but the Bible talks about pain and suffering in a positive way. Do you know that, well, Sadie's learning to walk. And, 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 you know, and she's taking a while in doing it because she knows that with walking comes bumps and bruises. You take a few steps and you end up face planting yourself on the ground. And, and, and there's something in her that says, yeah, I don't like that. But she's learning. Um, we injure ourselves in order to get better. We have to go to a doctor who hurts us more. It's called surgery. But that pain and suffering of surgery is for our benefit because it brings healing. Um, we suffer losses throughout our lifetime of a variety of things. But with every loss is an opportunity to be drawn closer to God as we put our trust in Him, isn't it? Even exercise can be painful. How many people <laughs> know that? If you want to train uh, if, for athletic competition on any level, that there's going to be pain involved and that pain is a good thing. Right, Chinda? Pain's a good thing because you say, yeah, it hurts, but it's benefiting me because it's making me stronger. What makes suffering hard, what makes suffering unbearable is when we don't understand why when we do not understand the purpose for the suffering or the pain that we're going through, then that suffering becomes something that causes us to question, question a lot of things. And Peter is bringing the reason for the suffering that the church is going through in the first century, and it's the same thing is true with us. We may not going through, be going through the same trials. We may end up with some of them. I don't know. But as Christians, we know that God can use the suffering that we have in our world. He doesn't always cause it, but he uses it. He uses fiery trials in a process of refining our lives and strengthening our faith. And so he says, don't be surprised when fiery trials come your way. We live in a sinful world. We have an enemy who hates us, and he is going to do everything he can to knock us off track, to make us, he can't steal away our salvation, but he can make us ineffective. But God uses those fiery trials, whatever they are, in that refining process. Now, the Bible uses many different times an, an analogy. The analogy is of purifying metal, gold, silver, any kind of metal. Usually metal is found in the earth in, in its ore form. It's a metal ore, and you have to go through the process of refining it. And, uh, and part of that process is to take that ore and melt it to an extremely high temperature so the metal melts. And if it's gold or silver, it's very dense, so it will sink to the bottom, and all the impurities will float to the top. Um, <clears throat> that's the process of refining. The metal is purified, but it takes tremendous heat in order for gold to melt and for the impurities to come to the surface. Now, that's an analogy of a fiery trial, right? That when God turns up the heat in our lives, <clears throat> stuff comes to the surface that we didn't know was there. Has that ever happened to you? It's like, oh my goodness, where did that attitude come from? Why did I respond that way? 
God, why are you turning the heat up in my life? Why am I going through this? Because God is interested in refining us and purifying our lives. And when that dross comes to the surface in the metal refining process, they will scoop it off. And then when the metal cools, you have pure metal that is free from any impurities that are in it. The metal is purified. The metal is strengthened. The same thing is true with us. That as we go through different things, we see the way we respond and react, and it may simply be something that we see in private. It may be something that becomes very public, and we go, oh, my goodness, I am so embarrassed. Uh, I remember there are times in my life where I have been absolutely embarrassed with the way I reacted when pressure came to my life. Anyone identify with that? Good. Well, we're good company. It's common. And what is God doing? He's basically saying, he doesn't say, oh, that shouldn't have been there. He doesn't condemn us. He says, no, let's remove it. Let's remove it. Let's scoop it off. And we learn through that process. You see, when we go through trials, it's an opportunity for us to demonstrate our faith in Christ, in the goodness of God. Faith is like a muscle. And a muscle can only grow when it's used. If you don't use the muscle, then it begins to atrophy, and faith is the same way. When do you use the muscle of faith? When you're going through trials. When things are going really well, that's rest. But when you're challenged, that's when our faith becomes real. You know, weight training is called resistance training. You're pushing against a weight in order to strengthen your muscle. When we resist the enemy, it's spiritual resistance training. When we resist the enemy, we put our faith in God. You see, these trials help us to become more like Jesus. And Peter goes on, he says, don't consider it strange when these things are happening to you. That's just a part of following Christ. You're going to have people who oppose you. Well, then what do we do? How do we respond? Verse 13, he says, but rejoice. He's like, okay, yeah, no. I can handle suffering with a purpose, but rejoicing? Are you serious? He says, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. What does he mean by that? Jesus said, uh, he said, uh, if if the world uh, hates me and persecutes me, They will hate and persecute my followers. And Jesus said that very plainly in in John. He said, uh, when we go into the world of culture around us that uh, that is captured and blinded by the enemy, that they are going to respond oftentimes negatively to those who are walking in faith. So why does a loving God allow us to suffer. The same reason a loving God sent his son into the world that he would suffer on behalf of lost humanity. We participate in the same sufferings that Jesus had. And and Peter calls it suffering in the name of Christ or bearing the name of Christ. It is um, what happens when we oppose evil around us. And and it doesn't mean that you have to take a a sign and go pick it on the rotary. It means that if someone says, gee, um, I think this is right, and we look and we say, that's not right, it's not biblical, and we just disagree, you're going to unleash the anger of the enemy through that person, right? And so sometimes we say, well, I'm just not going to say a thing. When we oppose evil in other people, it results in um, participating in the sufferings of Christ. Why did Jesus have to suffer? He suffered so as to display the righteousness of God, but also it was the price that was paid for salvation to humanity. And when we participate in the sufferings of Christ, we're doing the same thing. We're demonstrating that we are seeking to live our lives as best we can according to the righteousness of God. We want to be a witness for Christ, an example. And when we do that, we are also um, paying 
a general cost to bring salvation to humanity. What do I mean by that? We don't, Jesus died. He's the only atoning sacrifice. Uh, we don't atone for anybody else's sin. But when we stand for righteousness, and when we do so in the character and nature of God in a loving way, and we say, you know, I love you, but I don't agree with what you're doing, we're standing for righteousness. And when people see us willing to suffer for what we believe is right, the Holy Spirit can begin to move and begin to convict people of their sin and of the truth of God. And you'll never know who, what hearts can turn as we simply stand for what is true. So how should we respond when we are suffering at the hands of evil people? Well, should we go out and attack them? You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you? No. Do we verbally abuse them? No. Do we give them back a little bit about what they're giving us? No. We don't do that. Peter says that when we are attacked, we need to respond the way Jesus responded. How did Jesus respond when he was attacked going to Calvary? He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He didn't say a word. He was willing to endure the sufferings in order to demonstrate the goodness of God. And so there are times when we need to respond in the same way. We don't, uh, we don't respond in the way the world around us would respond. We don't get on Facebook and, and, and begin to unleash, uh, you know, give them a bit of our, what, what's on our mind. We don't do that. But we love people. We care for people. Um, we endure the sufferings and, uh, and, and we are willing not to take debate. And when we do that, we participate in the glory of Christ as well. If we share in his sufferings, we're going to gain his glory when he is revealed. Now, the Bible does not say rejoice in suffering. It says rejoice in Christ. Rejoicing in suffering, that's just weird. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm going to get some suffering this week. And isn't that great? No, 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 no. But we understand that there's a purpose for that, we participate with Christ. And when we share in his sufferings, we also get to share in his glory when he is revealed. So we don't go out of our way to get attacked. We, you know, don't try to f make people hate us <laughs> so that we can say, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, we don't do that. We go about our lives. We follow Christ. We love him. We serve him. And if we end up Going through a fiery trial, we say, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you revealing in me? What are you doing in other people's lives? How do you want me to respond? Now, Peter goes on in verse 14, and he says that there's a blessing in suffering. He says, verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. I doesn't feel blessing, but we are. He says, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. What's the blessing? It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When we are insulted and, and falsely accused, and when people stand against us simply because we follow Christ and they call us goody two-shoes and all that type of stuff, we don't respond by attacking them Rather, we respond in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes and he rests upon us. That is the anointing. And at that point, you can say, Lord, how do you want me to respond? Lord, there, there, there's an attack going on, which means that this person is uh, being prepared by you for truth. And, and whenever we're insulted, we've got, Two choices. We can either take the bait, oh yeah, <laughs> begin rolling up our sleeves. Taking the bait means we lost. Or um, we can respond the way Jesus responds, by loving the other person, by ignoring the insult, 
by moving beyond that. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit can then direct us and use us. Uh, There are so many illustrations of people, instances where people have done that, and and it brought conviction to the person who was being vile and and later led them to Christ. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke these words. He said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus' own words, he says, we are blessed. Again, it's not the, the, you know, the greatest thing to do, We don't say, I'm going to take a vacation and I'm just going to go get persecuted. We don't do that. But when it it happens, we are blessed because the Holy Spirit rests upon us. Now, Peter goes on. He says, let's qualify this. He says, if you suffer insults or you get arrested because you broke the law, you're a criminal, um, you know, you, you rob the bank, whatever it is. He says, that doesn't count. If you earn your suffering, it doesn't count for suffering for Christ. And he goes on and he says, you know, as a murderer or a thief or other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Huh, what's that? It's busybody. Someone who gets involved in other people's affairs without being asked. Someone who gossips, someone who just gets involved with things that they shouldn't be involved with. And, you know, that's not breaking the law. But he says, if you suffer because you're doing that, he says, that doesn't count. Doesn't count at all. You see, there are times in our lives and we can see this with other Christians, where God will call out our own hypocrisy. And, and we realize that we think we're suffering for Christ, and we, and we realize, no, I caused this. And when that happens, turn to Christ, repent, move on. That's just dross. The last part of this section is a it's a hard one he says verse 17 he says for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of god and we like "Ah, i'm okay with suffering i understand the purpose it's to reveal the righteousness of christ through our lives i understand that when i do that 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 people can see jesus that God is working to refine my life. But suffering as a part of God's judgment, well, don't we serve a loving God, a God who's filled with grace? Isn't the judgment of God something for the Old Testament? It's not the New Testament? No. The fact that God is a loving God helps us to understand what this judgment means. Now, when I say the word judgment, we all get pictures in our mind, don't we? Different pictures. Some of us may have God with thunderbolts and lightning bolts in his hand or whatever. Do you know what the word judgment means? Let me use a different word, discernment. Judgment is not punishment. It means discernment. And so Peter is saying the, the, the discernment, the separation begins with the house of God, with the people of God. The word judgment means to discern between, to separate, to apply a standard to decisions that are made, to actions that are done, and to qualify, is this righteous, is this unrighteous? And so the word judgment means to separate. It doesn't mean to punish. God has already begun the process of judging the earth. Because the invitation is open for anyone to come to Christ. And those who come to Christ 
have made a decision to receive the forgiveness of God, and, and God is going to discern in their lives and say they have received salvation. And he's separating those from, from people who have chosen to go their own way. He says, judgment begins with the house of God. And if it begins with the people of God, what's going to happen to those who refuse Christ? Very challenging verse to think about. That God is interested in refining the people of God. And when he judges our lives, he's going to look and he says, this is good, this needs to be improved. Let me put it in a, a very easy illustration. Think about a golf swing. Anyone here play golf? Okay. If you played golf, right, the way you swing the club is the most important thing because you either have power or not have power, and you just haul off and whack the ball. You don't know where it's going to go, but you learn how to swing the club. Now, people who are really into golf, they will pay a golf expert to judge them. And they will come and they will look at how someone swings the club and that person will judge how they're swinging their club and they're going to say, you need to change this, you need to make, you know, whatever tweaks need to come to their swing, they are in a process of judgment. And the purpose of that process is so that they can perfect their swing and, you know, and beat Tiger Woods or whatever. God is in the process of training us in righteousness. He's in the process of training us so that we can reign with Christ for all eternity. And his judgment is not punishment. It's not condemnation. It is the refining process in, his, in our lives. And he says the judgment of God is the love of God released in our lives so that we can learn how to live our lives in a way that brings glory to him. I want to read a passage from Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4. Just listen to this passage. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. They say judgment. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as his son. Now listen. Endure hardship. You could say endure fiery trials as discipline or judgment. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems present at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. So we can see in this passage that God is interested in training us in the way we live. He's interested in our everyday lives. He's interested in our attitudes, in our actions. And, and the only way that we can see what's wrong with our golf swing, if you will, is when we are under pressure, how do we respond? When we go through these trials, and Peter is saying to the church in the first century, when you're going through these things, this is an opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ. 
This is an opportunity to show the world that you trust in a living, risen Savior. Remember that when we suffer, it's because of the opposition of others to the name of Christ. And God rests upon us by his spirit. When we suffer for loving Jesus, it enables us to show the world that Jesus is alive and that he is worth giving your life to. And then the final conclusion is in verse 19, where Peter says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. You know, when we find ourselves in difficult situations, whatever they are, whatever the cause, how we respond is the most important thing. If we respond according to God's will, if we respond by saying, God, continue your refining process in my life, if we respond by saying, Lord, I want my life to be a witness to the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then God is working in us and we get to participate not only in Christ's sufferings but also in his glory. We participate in his mission. And and that is what Peter is encouraging the church. And I believe he's encouraging us. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us more than we can begin to imagine or understand. That your goodness is toward us. And Lord, because you are good and because you are loving, we understand that the nature of your judgment, your discernment in our life is to bring life and healing to each one of us. And so, Lord, we embrace, we endure the hardship and the sufferings that may come our way because you love us. And Lord, help us to keep eternity in view, that this life is temporary But, Lord, we're preparing for an eternity, uh, participating with Christ in the governing of the universe. Lord, teach us. Teach us what this passage means. Help us, Lord, to see um, the issues that we go through on a day-to-day basis from your perspective. Lord, we just ask that your presence would be with us, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us opportunities this week to be able to share the name of Christ with other people. Lord, that you would guide us in our lives. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.